Welcome everyone to the Planet Microcap Showcase Virtual 2022. I'm your host, Robert Kraft, and I'm really excited to introduce Team Asia for the Stock Pitch World Cup. And moderating for Team Asia, we have Kelvin Sito at Slingshot Cap on Twitter. He's my guy. We do, I don't know how many times we've done a ton of interviews together, but, you know, I, I'm, I'm just so thankful that he uh, uh, volunteered to uh, come on and, and moderate this session. So uh, with that, Kelvin, thanks for doing this, man. How you doing? Hey, Robert. Uh, thanks for having uh, us over here. I think uh, I think uh, when, whenever I look at uh, Asia companies, I always think that, it should uh, have gotten a, a you know more limelight around the world. I think a lot of uh, Asian companies are you know undercovered uh, as compared to uh, U.S. companies. So I'm you know, very excited to hear what are the pictures from the various uh, you know uh, presenters, and very excited for what you're doing uh, for this event. Absolutely, man. Well, look, you know, Kelvin, look, look, before before we get into the pitches, you know, just real quick, like give, give us your synopsis and your thoughts on why folks should really pay attention to Asia in ter- for micro caps right now. You know, I mean, look, Asia is obviously a huge continent. You know, China tends to suck up most of the air. But I mean, it turns out I think most the the two pitches we're about to hear are not China based at all. You know, so, you know, your thoughts there. Yeah. <clears throat> so um, I, I could be uh, uh, judging too quickly, but uh, you know I, I've been to the states. I've visited uh, several states: uh, uh, Oregon, uh, New York, uh, California. So by and large, I think that people in America they are they're quite alike. All right, so there are some differences, but they're quite alike. But however, if if one were to spend serious time traveling across Asia, right, Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, Cambodia. More, all, all these countries are very diverse and it, it really it has own, it is a, a character of its own, right? So I think um, when you look at that, I think a lot of uh, 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 these countries are still developing. So when I speak about they are developing, what do I mean by that? It means that, you know, on the average person's disposable income, right? It is still growing, right? There's more room to grow as compared to uh, individuals in the United States. And what can we think about this, right? What was the perspective that we are putting on? I mean, just look at India itself. As the country progresses, people's uh, disposable income uh, improves, right? They want to have uh, discretionary spending. Um, they want to buy uh, watches. You know, suddenly, once you reach a threshold where you can cover all your basic necessities, you, you reach a threshold where you are able to, you know, want to have a, a better life, better furniture, better homes, better cars, uh, you know, everything is better. Right? And I think it, the consumerism is, is still at the infancy, right? And I think there's still a lot more room to grow. And at the same time, you know, I've, I've looked into some software companies that's based in Asia. And I would always argue, right, if, if these companies were to be listed in uh, America, they would, of course, command higher valuation. Because it seems to me that it's very clear that uh, investors in, in, in the United States, they are very sophisticated, they understand um, uh, you know, the advantages of having a subscription revenues. So I think if you want me to kind of uh, make it to uh, just two points, I think uh, uh, the valuations are, are, are much better in Asia, right? I think it's a less crowded area and there's less coverage, which means you could get uh, more bargains. And second is that um, if you look at it in the long, uh, as a runway for growth, right? Um, I believe it's, it's stronger, more durable and more, uh, more promising. Right, so I'm not here to say that uh, you know America is not a good company, but I'm saying that uh, all in all, you know, having some exposure allocation in Asia is not too bad, especially in the consumer uh, uh, names, because uh, these are the companies that will do uh, incredibly well. And over time, as you look at these uh, large MNCs that's based in the United States, they are actually investing more money in all these um, Asian countries, and they have said that they want to grow you know, a larger percentage of their revenue contribution outside the United States, more from a Southeast Asia perspective. And that's also, a, you know, a clear sign that they expect more growth to come out from outside the United States. So that's really how um, I look at it. Absolutely. And that does some great insights right there. One more question before we get to the pitches, because people might be listening to this and like, all right, Kelvin, I'm with you, man. But how do I get exposure without, you know, just... <clears throat> buying into an ETF, buying a basket, you know, how do you, for stock pickers, you know, that's mostly our micro cap investor audience, right? Real, those true blue stock pickers. 
what's the easiest way to on-ramp into finding that next best, you know, Asian micro cap stock? Yeah, so um, I, I think one of the presenters here yeah, run a, a newsletter uh, service itself and myself, I, I do, uh, you know, uh, once in a while, do look through his, his picks as well. So his name is Michael. He runs a Asian uh, century newsletter. So that's one way you can uh, look into. And I think um, uh, you'll be very surprised to see how certain companies, you know, have a long record of durable growth, yet its valuations are undemanding. And, you know, just to promote Asia a little bit more, uh, you know, uh, you know, I think a lot of people like to quote Buffett, right? Buffett has been known to build, you know, in recent times, build position in some of the Jap- Japanese uh, names, right? So I think it would be very exciting to see in the next few years how he developed that uh, portfolio allocation, you know, as part of the entire Berkshire's investment strategy. Very good. All right, Kelvin. Well, without further ado, let's not keep the people waiting anymore. Let's get started with uh, the stock pitches for Team Asia. So let's let it rip. All right, everyone. So for the first uh, pitch that we have, is comes from Michael. Michael runs uh, Asian Century Stocks. You know, uh, some of you might have already followed him on Twitter. He's one of the most prolific uh, writers on the stocks in Asia, across Indonesia, Japan, Singapore, Malaysia, so for me, I've been following him, even met him once, and you know he really delivers very high quality content out there. So I'm very, very excited. Can't wait for him to present. So Michael, to you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. So today we'll we'll speak about a um, not quite a small cap. I mean, not micro cap, but rather small cap. It's a two billion USD market cap company called Casio Computer, and most known for their uh, G-Shock line of uh, timepieces. And full, full disclosure, I'm a shareholder of Casio. And um, just to, to pitch it very quickly, it's, a, it's really a bet uh, not necessarily on, on a lot of growth, but rather the fact that there's been issues short term with their China business due to China's zero COVID policy and also in, immense weakness in the Japanese yen. Yet the share price hasn't responded yet. And that's a little bit odd to me. And I was, I, I'll explain exactly why I think that's an opportunity. Um, so this is uh, G-Shock. These, these are how modern G-Shocks look like. And um, they have been um, innovating, I would say, quite rapidly recently. So it's a 2 billion market cap company. They have lots of cash in the balance sheet, just like many other Japanese companies. And um, the, uh, the EV is about 1.6 billion USD right now. And it's quite liquid. You can also buy it via interactive brokers. So that's another benefit of buying Japanese stocks. And Casio, I think they have a number of products, but to make it really clear, it's all about the timepiece segment. Um, 60% of revenues, but the vast majority of, uh, of profits. And the other, the other products such as calculators, musical instruments are a little bit lower margins and just not that significant. So it's about timepieces and it's about G-Shock in particular, which remains their most popular brand name. Uh, and also worth mentioning that they sell globally. They are not a Japanese company. And that's why it's so strange to see the, the, uh, the share price. It's fallen with the yen, even though it's actually an international business. So I would think that the, the share price uh, should actually go up with the depreciation of the yen. But um, more about that later. So it was, it was before that, um, it was formed uh, in the 1950s uh, by the four Casio brothers. And um, the family still runs the company. The only difference is it's now run as you know, by the second generation since 2018. And that's led to some innovation. But as you can see, see here, the, it's an electronics company that's done a variety of products, including calculators. Um, the G-Shock was invented in 1983. And um, today it's somewhat of a legend because it's so they're, they're so durable, uh, they're so cheap, and, and I think uh, increasingly fashionable as well. Uh, that they're well known, not just in Japan, but but really globally. And um, what makes them unique is the fact that you can you can abuse them as much as you want, and nothing will happen to them. They will keep running for for many years or even decades um, because of the construction here. You can see using uh, using rubber um, rubber construction in in uh, inside a um, a module a module inside a floating construction. So uh, these are G-Shocks throughout history. You can tell that there's been a few shifts over time, 
uh, from resin to, um, to more heavy duty models in the two, 2010s. And more recently, they've shifted to metal, which are a lot more high margin models and more fashion, I believe. Uh, the product, product portfolio is quite diverse, but you have those more uh, fashionable items like the new uh, Cassie Oaks, as well as the uh, Master of G models, which are used more for heavy duty purposes. Uh, so these are the G-Shock shipments. And my point with this chart is the fact that it's a growth business. It is not stagnant. It is this, this potential and it's still relevant despite the fact that you've had more competition with the Apple Watch. Uh, these are the operating profit by segment. So you can see here timepieces is all, all that really matters. Uh, so the Apple Watch, I mean, I think whenever I mention Casio and G-Shock, people say, yeah, but what about the Apple Watch? And it's... What's interesting is that Casio is one of the few that's actually grown, despite the fact that the uh, Apple Watch was released in 2015. And uh, you can see here that the, the, the volumes of wearable electronics, such as Garmin and Apple Watch, has gone up. But like I said, even despite that, Casio is still growing nicely. And I think that's the reason why is because G-Shock has its own niche, uh, battery life, you don't have to charge it every day like an Apple Watch. Uh, they're really inexpensive. So the watch you see here costs about uh, 100 USD, which is not a lot of money compared to an Apple Watch which is more over 400 and also requires an iPhone. They're durable, practically indestructible, and they're also collectible because they're, um, they have all sorts of uh, model variation, different colorways and so on. Uh, so I think it's, it occupies its own niche, and I think that's kind of a moat. There's no competition, really, in this lower-end segment. And uh, these are Google Trend uh, search query charts, uh, just to show that the, the mind share might have decreased a little bit since Apple Watch, but um, more recently, new models have been very successful, and um, that's because of um, the re reorganization in 2018, which I will speak more about later. Uh, we'll probably skip this slide, I guess. Um, this is a quote from um, a co-inventor of the G-Shock uh, that the key point of, of a G-Shock is that they can be used forever. The, there will be no need for the recharging, no battery replacement or any maintenance, which is really quite different from Apple Watch and why I argue that it's actually quite safe from competition. Uh, customer reviews, very positive. I mean, there's a very loyal following of, of G-Shock. Um, um, so yeah, so this is the chart, but it's it's in it's in yen terms, and I just want to make the point that uh, in US dollar terms, it's really a global business. In US dollar terms, the enterprise value is an all-time low, close to an all-time low, and um, in yen terms, it's it's just at a local bottom, and. Um, the, uh, the recent weakness in, in the past year has more to do with China's, the Chinese business, which has been hurt by the zero COVID policy. But uh, as, we, as you may know, the zero COVID policy is, is being adjusted. It's becoming more of an active control policy or a slow burn uh, with the letting COVID spread in China. So I think this business is going to recover. High shipping costs, also very temporary. Chip shortages, also temporary. Uh, so um, these headwinds are really in in the in the in the back rearview mirror. And lastly, I want to just point out the fact that um, the new management team uh, from 2018, which, the, which is the first one apart from the from the four founders of Casio to run the business, he's installed uh, this younger person here. He's installed um, Kasuhiro Casio. He's installed a new management team. And uh, he's also restructured the business to become more sensitive to customer demands. So um, the, the yen depreciation is really the key point here. Um, I believed that you could reach about 48 billion in, in operating profits. Now, maybe we're closer to 40 billion, but with a 240 billion enterprise value, you're looking at maybe EV to EBIT of six. And um, let me show you here. These are new models of, of G-Shock. Uh, this is the enterprise value in USD. Uh, let me just show you here the, the EV, the uh, PE. I think the PE might not come down to 10 times with the current uh, yen level of 140 to Euro and one, 140 as well to the US dollar. 
but um, you might come down to about 12 times versus 22 times historically. So it's it's really a short-term bet on uh, on the weaker yen, and it's a very safe business uh, that I think we can feel comfortable with that they will they will survive and, and, and thrive for many, many years with no debt and plenty of cash and balance sheets. And you're also betting on, on China's zero COVID policy kind of, um, um, I, I guess, being phased out in the next uh, six to nine months. Uh, and then you also have these new metal models, one of which you can see here, which I think will, will at least ensure some kind of uh, stability or hopefully some, some growth, at least in, in ASP. So that's a short uh, introduction to, to Casio. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for sharing. Um, the, the latest models does look very slick and fashionable. And I think, you know, whenever we think about Casio, you know, we, we always relate it back to G-Shop. I think if, even for me, like growing up, uh, G-Shop has been something, uh, I had it. I, I can't remember where, where, where I left my G-Shop. But I'd like to ask you for, for a couple of uh, questions, right? So it's known for, Japanese companies to hoard a lot of cash. In fact, to some extent, foreign investors might not be able to understand why do these Japanese hoard cash. So I want to find out from you because looking at Casio's balance sheet, they seem to have a huge amount of cash. And of course, you know, with the rising interest rates, uh, you know, they, they might benefit from that. Um, so you know, with, with such a low valuation that you are currently seeing, you know, is there any indication from the management for any? Uh, you know, share buyback policy or what's the cash management, uh, you know, policy? Well, there's been share buybacks, uh, but it's, it's been, it's modest, you know, over the past 10 years. I think, I think the share cap is down maybe like 10%. And um, Japan, unfortunately, it's, the capital allocation is, is not as good as in North America. There's just no comparison. And the reason they, um, they accumulate cash is because they want to make sure that they can pay employees whatever happens. So uh, they really not run for shareholders in the same, quite the same way as, uh, as American companies. And you just have to discount the, the cash. So they have about almost 600 million US dollars in cash. Maybe you shouldn't uh, assume that, that that cash belongs to you. You should maybe discount the cash by 50% or something like that. Uh, so unfortunately, this is something you see in, in every Japanese company. The, the upside is uh, there's not much downside in the company because they have so much cash, it's such a cushion. Um, but unfortunately, uh, yeah, you, you're not going to see, uh, you know, massive share buybacks. They're, they're far too conservative for that. Got it, got it. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I saw there was a huge rebound you know, in terms of the financial results. Uh, as you are presenting, you know, not, that got me very intrigued um, about Casio's results. I took a look at um, the results. I think uh, year on year, the net sales improved by more than 108%. Operating profit grew by eighty four percent on the on the, the recent results basis. Um, what was most of it contributed by currency? Um, oh, I, I'm not sure if, okay, I I'm not sure if the results were that good recently. I mean, they they've been a little bit weak actually because of China's zero COVID policy, and um, but it, but what we've seen with many Japanese companies is that this weaker yen. At least for these these you know large uh, companies with with you know big global presence, it takes one or two quarters for the for the um, for the overseas revenues to translate into higher uh, yen profits, and um, so I would expect actually a, a lot more in the future in terms of the translation effect from a from a weak yen, and um, it's not totally straightforward, but I, but I think that the um, it, it, it is wrong to look at this from a yen perspective. We should look at it from a US dollar perspective or a you know trade weighted perspective. And um, yeah, and I, I will also want to mention that uh, the reason why I, I you know I've been looking at Casio for a long time, but the reason why I, I'm so interested is because they produce most of their watches in Japan, uh, or most of the components in Japan. PPE eighty percent in Japan, so you should expect. Uh, some margin expansion as well, and um, anyway, so I, I I definitely think that there will be uh, there's more to come uh, with the wiki yen and also with China's zero COVID policy, you know, easing over the next few quarters. You should expect uh, sequential improvements even further. Got it, got it. And uh, just just to uh, 
put out a disclaimer. As of right now, I'm not a shareholder of a Casio, but definitely got me intrigued. Um, maybe just to wrap up with one uh, final question. You know, I think when we look back in year 2020, when interest rates was very low, um, you know, a lot of stocks definitely had gone up. And it seemed to me that, uh, you know, a lot of investors might have forgotten about the risk of, uh, of companies, right? We just look at upside, but we don't really look at the downside. So, uh, Michael, like, if I had to squeeze out one uh, thing that you don't like about Casio currently, you know, for the investors to have a more uh, balanced uh, perspective on the company, uh, what would it be? Like, just one thing. Uh, well, it's it's the smart watch competition. So, so right now, you know, Apple Watch has become slowly, slowly becoming more popular and the volumes are, are very large i mean many people are buying apple watches um so if if the apple watch can Im- you know significantly improve its battery life like you know beyond just two days but if you, you can, if you increase it to seven days or, or like a few weeks that will i think will be problematic um the new apple watch ultra is also quite quite uh, quite durable although you know at least uh, where I live here, I mean, they, they're quite expensive. They're like eight times the price or something like that of, of a Casio. But um, but yeah, it's it's really, I think, you know, Casio, they've came out with a few G-Shock smartwatches. They're just not working very well, laggy and, and uh, poor software and so on. So um, I think that's uh, that transition hasn't, hasn't really happened. I, personally, I don't think it's a huge issue because these watches aren't crucial the way the smartphones are. You don't necessarily need an Apple Watch unless you want notifications. So I think that there's a lot of people who don't mind wearing mechanical watches and might even have a you know one or, or a few G-Shocks just to uh, uh, just as an alternative. So um, so we see, I, I think there's a niche here. I mean, it, it's 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 really um, you 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 know you talked about downside risks. Like from my perspective, this is the uh, this is the moment when the downside risk is controlled because you've got the weak yen. That's a that's a positive tailwind, and the the negative effects from from China's zero COVID policy are already priced in and getting better actually. So, um, and the, the cash is there. So, um, I I think it's it's really asymmetric to me the whole situation um, uh, and and very safe in in my view. Not an investment recommendation, but that's just my view. <laughs> Yes. Um, Michael, thank you so much for spending your time with us. Uh, and, you know, uh, how can people find out more about the work that you are doing uh, around uh, Asian stocks? Sure. Okay. So, yeah, I pitched Casio on my Substack, yeah, Asian Century Stocks, which is my full time job. I, I write on, false, on Substack uh, as a profession. And uh, you can find a lot more ideas there if you want. All right. Thank you, Michael, for presenting. Thank you. All right. Hi, everyone. For the second presenter, we have uh, Jin Hao. He's a college student uh, right now, uh, based in Singapore. And uh, you know how I chanced upon him was, uh, of course, through Twitter. But what is known, what is not known to many people, is that he runs. Uh, you know, in fact, he publishes several articles on Seeking Alpha. They have gotten a lot of uh, praises from, you know, fund managers, uh, from reputable investors as well. And you know the kind of, you know, just like Michael, you know, the pace of him pushing out articles. Uh, is there and it has been consistent, you know, a really high quality uh, article. So, you know, I guess, I, I guess I'll let Jin Hao uh, introduce himself a little bit and then, uh, you know, we can start uh, presenting. So Jin Hao, to you. Yeah. Yeah. So um, thanks, Robert. And of course, Sito for inviting me here, you know, and of course the opportunity to speak to everyone. So the companies that I'm going to be talking about is Azul System Holdings. Uh, so just a short intro about myself. I'm actually a student in uh, National University of Singapore. So I'm actually gonna I'm actually in business and I'm gonna intend to specialize in finance. Yeah, so the companies that I'm gonna be bitching about today is other system holdings. I don't have um, a stake in it, but I do find it to be a really interesting and a really high quality company. So just let me uh, get right started. So what is Azure system and why does this opportunity exist, right? It is a, first of all, a 222 million microcap company with a really large to the addressable market. 
And its high margin SaaS business is being masked by the IT business, the lumpy IT business. And this is being misunderstood as a Zoom alternative, but it's actually a really sticky product. And it is being listed in the Singapore Stock Exchange, where the software companies are not generally being well understood. It has an impressive return on invested capital, a strong balance sheet with no debt, and more importantly, so they have a management with really high skin in the game. So Azus has two business segments. Firstly, it is its high margin recurring revenue software business called Azus Convin. And then secondly, it has a lumpy lower margin IT service revenue business. So let's talk about Azus Convin. So Azus Convin is a bot management software for executives and secretary to host online bot meetings. And this actually deals all the way back into how a physical bot meeting is being held. It's incredibly inefficient and it's very time consuming because there's a lot of time that are being spent on preparing for bot meetings, right? Think about all the amount of paperwork that you have to do to prepare for a, scared, for a meeting agenda. All of this results in a really, really poor customer experience. And Azus Convin is here to provide an all-in-one platform for all bot meeting needs. You have multiple features like video conferencing, live presentation tools, and it enables real-time collaboration. And more importantly, there is no need for paperwork. There is no need for physical meetings. And this really helps to reduce the time to prepare for meetings and helps to streamline the bot meeting process. And overall, it provides a better customer experience. And this is an essential and sticky product. Why? Because customers are unlikely to return to the old way of doing bot meetings. So Azus Coffee has a really high quality customer base, right? And then they focus on the mid and the price market, right? There are companies like Fidelity International, American First Credit Union. And according to the management, they have clients from Fortune 500, from FDSE 100, governments, financial institutions, non-profit organization from all over 100 countries. And I think this really signifies a really huge total addressable market for Azus Coffee. And this is the overall um, customer review. According to G2 and Captera, they have a really high customer's review. And on the left side, you could see that Azus Convin is being placed at the leader's category. So I think this points to two things, right? Firstly, um, there is very strong customer satisfaction. And secondly, uh, it's positioning among its competitors. So the, the general review that uh, I uh, that they receive is really how they help to save time and help to increase efficiency. But there was one particular thing that caught my eye, and it was Azus Convin low cost, and yet it offers the same or if not more fun functionalities as compared to other competitors. So for non-profit charities and like very value conscious companies, right, cost is really an important factor, and. And if you think from a uh, non-profit organization point of view, um, it's really, really very important. And uh, other than offering just really low cost, they really also offer really good features. And from an enterprise point of view, you know that um, generally they are more rigorous and more careful in choosing software that not only provides the best functionalities, but also value for money. And I think choosing Azure's Convin is really a testament to its value proposition. So you can see its revenue has compiled at 15% Kager and that's equivalent to about 12 times increase. And as it makes up a higher revenue mix, its margin, gross margin expanded from all the way from 26% in FY17 to 72% in FY22. So let's talk about the second business segment, which is the IT service. So I, Azus is actually an IT consulting service provider based in Hong Kong, but it also has operation in UK, Philippines, and China. And it has attained the level five CMMI model, which shows that they can really develop high quality softwares. It helps to implement IT software and systems and help develop and integrate software programs for customers. And after those implement implementations, they also provide maintenance and support services. And so far, they are the first and only one that won uh, that secure outsourcing projects from the Hong Kong government. And just recently, they won the largest contract which is worth about $100 billion from uh, the HK SER government. And they have really so, uh, solid track record. They completed over 100 projects for government departments and for the private sector. And many of them are repeat customers. So there are three revenue streams. 
uh, the system system implementation which are lumpy, the one time we are hardware sales, and then thirdly the recurring maintenance and support services which occurs after the implementation. So this is the revenue breakdown. Um, if you look at its revenue, it mainly fluctuates, uh, which explains why uh, it's really lumpy. But FY21 was an outlier because it was being affected by COVID. And uh, the revenues that they generated is dependent on how many contracts that they secure. So in terms of profitability, you can see that um, it has really strong operating leverage. Um, its operating profit grew 17 times and it expanded its operating margin by 20%. And um, its earnings per share, it compounded at 99% CAGR in five years. And this shows that on a per share basis, they are generating shareholders value at little to no share dilution. And I think this really sums it up for, uh, for Azus, right? Because it's return on cap invested capital from 19% all the way to 238%. It really shows uh, the management capital location skills um, in, uh, to allocate capital into really profitable investments. And more importantly so, uh, they are cash rich uh, with no debt at all. So skin in the game, uh, the founder Li Wan Chik, uh, who spent 31 years in the company uh, and his wife owned about 87% of the ships of Sydney. And uh, just a background about him, he owns a Bachelor of Science in Computer Science Engineering, Bachelor of Science in Mathematics for MIT as well. And he's also a fellow member of the Hong Kong Institution of Engineers and past chairman of his IT division. And Michael, who is the current CEO, he, he, he was in the company for 18 years and he replaced uh, Li Wan Chik as the CEO in March 2022. He also served as a CEO of various government agencies, founded uh, software businesses, served as the board of director of uh, public listed private companies. So in terms of valuation, uh, the second half of every year is always a stronger half. And as mentioned earlier, uh, this IP service revenue was made up impacted by COVID. And they recently reported its first half to initial revenue. And my assumptions going forward uh, is on a forward one year uh, valuation is that on the last 12 month basis, uh, my revenue, my assumptions for its IT service revenue will be $92.7 million. And then uh, for Azus product, it will be $184 million. And with a 25 operating margin, uh, this gives me about $12.2 million sing dollars operating profit. And then with a 20 times multiple, this gives me an enterprise value of 243 million. And so what do I, um, uh, is margin actually, I forecast that its margin will increase to 25% from 23% the previous year. And that's because as Azus products makes up a higher revenue mix, it will have uh, room for margin expansion. So the, the, the biggest risk that I see is it's extremely illiquid, right? Um, there's barely any trading, any buying and selling at all. So the buying and selling can be a lot harder and stocks can be very, very volatile. And uh, weak execution, like um, a lot of companies, uh, particularly for Azus Convene, uh, the ability to expand market share, it really depends on the management ability to execute as it grows bigger and bigger. And weak execution can lead to slower growth or stagnant or declining margins. And that is because in my valuation, I embed that um, as Azus product grows even bigger, uh, even the higher revenue mix is going to uh, result in higher operating margin. And the inability to do so can render that uh, impossible. So uh, this is the end of my presentation. And I want to thank um, all of you for listening. Yep. All right. Thank you, Jin <coughs> Thanks for your uh, sharing. So I think one yep. thing that, that uh, stood out uh, from my perspective is that, you know, whenever you look at management, I think, it, it would be natural for us to want the management to have some skin in the game, right? To have yeah. some uh, you know, 20% shares of the company or, or whatnot. But, uh, you know, recently there's this debate about Mark Zuckerberg of Meta, uh, you, know, uh, you know, spending a lot of his company's money on the Metaverse aspirations. And a lot of it, a lot of investors, uh, you know, have a view that Mark Zuckerberg was irresponsible. And they, they, they say, hey, you know, you look at Mark Zuckerberg's uh, um, shares, you know, I think in America we have class A, class B, class B has more voting rights. Uh, you know, Mark Zuckerberg had has more than over 50% voting rights. So no one could really take him down, right? So um, in a way, in terms of corporate governance, that may not be uh, uh, really good, right? Because there's no uh, no one who could really 
uh, change his, his mind you know, if, if they wanted. So just coming back to uh, Azus, right? So, you know, look at the management. I think they fall a very concentrated uh, position in the company, almost like uh, more than 80%. I mean, if they want to privatize, they could, right? Mm-hmm. So um, do, do you think that having a concentrated shareholder base will deter the company from being uh, re-rated or, you know, look at it, uh, the, the issue that you highlighted being illiquid? I do think it will prevent the stock from being uh, re-rated, being recognized by um, outside investors outside of uh, Singapore. Yeah, I, I think that's really the issue though, because um, first of all, yeah, they own most of their shares outstanding and then um, there's not much exposure in, uh, in, in the stock. I'm not sure why, uh, but it could be that uh, the management may not be that promotional, right? They do it because in, in companies in US, they go on investigations, they go for press releases, and then that's how they get coverage, how they get investors to notice about them. But I haven't been able to find um, any sort of um, a, a coverage on that. Maybe um, that's the thing about Singapore stocks. Uh, maybe they, they don't just don't do a lot of, um, uh, of this type of events. Um, but I will say that it's yeah. But w- would they get privatized though? Um, I don't think it's an it's, it's an issue to be honest. Uh, in in my in my view, because this company has been around for a very long time, and I think if they really wants to get it privatized, they would actually already do so. So um, it, it would it would definitely be a problem going forward, which is why I put it in my risk that it's extremely illiquid, and um, unless people knows more about them. And uh, maybe if they understood software companies, they know that uh, the software company is growing uh, really quickly, then I think it can get um, re- uh, some coverage in it. I think it will be good, but I-, I do think it will be a problem going forward, you know, in terms of getting investors to notice about them. Yeah. Got it, got it. <clears throat> and yeah. the second question I have, uh, just curious about your thoughts, because when we look at Zoom, um, of course, with the pandemic being over, the growth rates for Zoom have sort of a normalize, uh, not, mm-hmm. no longer triple digits have, of course, normalized. So when we look at Con- Convene, right, which is a board management too, I think some people might have mistaken it uh, to be uh, to be a yeah. product that's to Zoom. Um, mm-hmm. Do you foresee or, or are there really signs to say that, hey, you know, Convene is still uh, experiencing its upward trajectory in terms of growth? Or do you, do you see that the, the board members decide to go back to the physical way of, um, hosting meetings or do they still have a private uh, hybrid model or you know, is there a churn that you see in the Convene uh, uh, product itself? Okay, so uh, okay, Azus Convene is a digital platform but I'm not saying that uh, they won't hold any physical meetings. They will still do but it's just that it makes things a lot easier for them just, just to make their life easier. So, um, okay, so th- I think there's always this uh, misconception that uh, it's a uh, alternative to Zoom, but um, there's one thing that I that I did mention, uh, which you 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 pointed pointed it out, is that um, Azus Covin has a very strong security, um, um, strong encryption, because for board meetings, uh, there is a lot of documents that are confidential, it's private. Uh, you you can't just use Zoom for those type of information. You just can't do so. And um, for a customer's point of view. Um, do you want to be using like so many softwares, Zoom, and then you have like Google Meet, you have like Microsoft Teams. You wouldn't want to do that, right? Uh, you, you have that in mind, firstly. Uh, you need to have multiple features. And then secondly, you need to have security. And I think that's what Azus Convene provide to the customers. Because without the security, without the multiple features that is being integrated into one platform, um, I don't think it's fair to say that uh, it's an alternative. It's an even better uh, value proposition to um, really enterprises, non-profit organizations. Yeah, so yeah, that is my, my thoughts on it. All right, makes sense. Uh, yeah. Just one final question. <clears throat> I think a lot of, um, you, know, you know, there's this book uh, uh, called Hidden Champions, which is uh, really highlights uh, Asian companies. And they say that the hallmark of an uh, Asian company is to be able to write the globalization trend and it's derived, you know, despite being situated in an Asian country, but you are able to derive more revenues from countries like uh, you know, Europe, like UK, like uh, USA as well. So, um, so do you have a like a sort of like a breakdown? You know, are they generating more revenues outside of Hong Kong and 
Singapore has that been increasing or you know Hong Kong and Singapore are still the, the main contributor to the revenue? Oh, um, I haven't really uh, sort of noticed about that. But uh, okay, uh, but from their customers, um, um, uh, going back to the slide earlier on, right? I think there is a lot of uh, international companies that are recognizing Azus Convene. So um, even if I think they, they were to generate most of their revenue in Hong Kong, uh, which is um, supposedly so because uh, because they have been in the business for such a, such a long time, right? Uh, so the revenues may, may, may come from Hong Kong because they have an established base there. But I think if you look at the customers that they have, I think the international revenue, um, it, it, it will go up over time, definitely. Because they are, looking at the customers, there are so many established customers over there. So I would, I would not be surprised even if they were to get recognition uh, globally uh, from, you know, from really from other financial institutions and all those. Yeah. All right. Got it. Got yeah. it. All right, yeah. thanks for the presentation once again. Uh, just want to uh, uh, thank everyone for presenting. But you know, like, how can people uh, find out uh, more about you? You know, your thoughts about investing and what are the latest companies that you are potentially covering? Yep. Oh yeah. Uh, so at, at the first slide, uh, I actually put my 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 Twitter there. So you can head to my Twitter. You can connect with me over there. Uh, then uh, I also run the Skin Alpha, right? So you can follow me on Skin Alpha, and yeah, just just send me a message on Twitter. I'll, I'll definitely uh, that's how how you can get in touch with me. That's the best way. Yeah. All right, sounds good. All right, once again, thank you, Jin Hao, and thank you, Michael, for presenting. For full disclosure purpose, I'm not a shareholder of Azure Systems Holdings. So, Kelvin, thank you so much for uh, moderating today's Team Asia session for the Stock Pitch World Cup. To close everything out here, where can folks go and follow you for more information? Robert, you know, it has been a pleasure and thank you for hosting, organizing this event, you know, shine a, you know, some spotlight to on Asian companies. So uh, for the viewers, if you're interested to follow me, uh, I'm on Twitter. So that's called Sling Shot Cap, C-A-P, uh, Cap. Uh, it's short form for Capital. So Sling Shot Cap. Awesome. All right, Calvin. Thank you so much, man. Really appreciate it.